Hello and welcome to Insight of Thelmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to the Squint series. Today we are going to discuss about some very important and basic aspects of squint examination. First, we shall be studying about the Hirschberg's corneal reflex. First of all, what is strabismus or squint? Now, strabismus is basically a condition in which the visual axis of the eye are not parallel, right? Now, at this time, you should know what is meant by visual axis. Visual axis is an axis which is drawn from the point of fixation, that means where you are looking at, to the fovea, okay? So, if you draw a line from the, uh, from the point of fixation to the fovea, that is called the visual axis. Now, if both the eyes have similar visual axis, parallel visual axis, if both the eyes are looking straight forward, that is called an orthotropia. Okay, so these terms are also very, very important. So what is orthotropia? Orthotropia is when both the eyes are actually looking straight forward, which is a normal physiological condition, right? However, if one or the other eye is either deviated to one side, maybe deviated towards left, right, up, or down. Now such a condition will lead to the visual axis being directed in different directions. Okay, They're not leading to one single fixation point. Now such a condition is called heterotropia. Right? So the term hetero means that the two visual axes are not coinciding on a single visual point. Okay, And this is what is known as strabismus or squint. So I hope that is clear. Now, squint or strabismus is basically a deviation of one eye, right? So, if the eye is diverted towards outside, deviated towards outside, that is called exodeviation, right? So, you can remember it as ex, ex means exterior, right? So, if the eye is deviated outside, it is called exodeviation. If the eye is deviated towards the nose that is inside, it is called esodeviation. If the eye is deviated upwards, it is called hyperdeviation. If the eye is deviated downwards, that is called hypodeviation. Now, as I told you that, the term hetero means that both the eyes are not looking straight forward. Their visual axis is not directed together towards a fixation point. But what is meant by heterophoria and heterotropia? That means there is some difference between phorias and tropia. So, heterophoria is that a person who has a tendency of developing squint or who has a tendency of deviation of one eye is still looking orthotropic to you and why is he looking orthotropic to you he's looking orthotropic because he's taking control of that squint by using his fusion right so using this capability of fusion he's still able to look straight ahead now such a condition where the fusion is taking care of the squint and the squint is not apparent to you such a condition is called a heterophoria, right? However, if the strabismus become too large or if the squint becomes too large, the fusion will not be able to take care of that large angle of strabismus. And in those conditions, what will happen is you will be actually able to see the squint. The squint will become manifest. Okay, it will be quite apparent. Now, such a constant pres uh, constantly present squint is called atropia, okay, or heterotropia. Now, let us have a look at this. In the first picture, you can see that the child is uh, using both her eyes to look at an object. That means this is a binocular condition, right? So, a binocular condition means the patient is using both, uh, both his or her eyes, right? So, in this binocular condition, you can see that the both eyes seems to be parallel. The visual axis seems to be parallel, right? In the second picture, however, now what have we done? We have put a translucent occluder in front of one eye. And what can we see that? We can see behind that transluder, the eye has actually rotated inwards, right now what have we done basically here is by placing a occluder in front of the eye we have changed this binocular condition to basically a uniocular condition right and you should know that the fusion will always work under a binocular condition only a fusion is a binocular faculty right so if you make the patient uniocular the patient will not be able to use now it's his or her fusion right this is also called as dissociation. So we have basically dissociated the, uh, the two eyes or we have disrupted the patient's fusion, 
Now, as we disrupt this fusion or as we dissociate the two eyes, what will happen? The underlying tendency of these eyes to actually squint or deviate will now come out. Okay, and therefore, again, as you can see in the third picture as well, as, as you place the, tra the translucent occluder in front of the left eye, the left eye is again deviating inwards. What does it tell you? It tells us that this child actually has a phoria. That means the child actually has a tendency to squint and the child is taking care of that squinting tendency by his, by his or her fusion. Right now, it's only a matter of fact that when the fusion goes away, the phoria will now become tropia. And now, if the child would have tropia, you will actually see deviating eye right in the first picture itself. Right, so I hope that is clear. So, this condition is nothing but it is a phoria where the fusion was taking care of it, and now by putting an occluder we have actually disrupted or dissociated both the eyes so now fusion cannot take place and therefore uh, that we can see that the eyes are actually now deviating under the under those translucent occluders so this was a phoria in the series we are going to discuss about how do we first detect that squint is present or not after we know that squint is present how do we actually just you know estimate the angle of squint and estimate the squint and third is how do you actually objectively measure that squint. So first let us talk about the detection of strabismus. For the purpose of detection, basically that means in your inspection, okay, you're going to observe the patient's appearance. There are certain appearances which will tell you that this patient might have actually squint. Okay, okay. Now the second thing is you will observe the position of the corneal reflexes and that is what is called as the Hirschberg's corneal reflex. And the third is the cover test. Now, I don't want to make this video too heavy to understand and therefore the cover test will be included in a separate video. First is you observe the patient's appearance. As the patient comes to you or walks in the clinic, there are certain clues which will tell you that this person actually has squint. Now, many a times, obviously, the patient will have very obvious tropias, right? So there will be a deviation, there will be an exodeviation or an esodeviation, the eye is up, that is hyper or hypodeviation. But sometimes the eyes will actually be orthotropic, but still there will be complaints. And such patients you can actually pick up uh, to have strabismus based on their appearance. Now, the first thing that you're going to pick up in their appearance is the position of the head, right? And this is also called abnormal head posture or an abnormal head position. Now, again here, I will not go into the details of the AHP because that is again a very detailed topic. But basically what you need to know is that we have three types of abnormal head posture. We can either have chin up or chin down. We can have face turn or head turn towards right or left, or we can have a head tilt towards right or left. Okay, so this asymmetry of the face is usually very common, you know, in a congenital head tilt. Example, congenital head tilt, which is associated with the vertical muscle palsies like the oblique muscle palsies. What you need to know at this level is that whenever a patient comes to you with chin up or chin down position, it is basically the problems with your vertical movements. Okay, that means elevation and depression. Now, however, if the person comes to you with some sort of face turns, that is, that is the horizontal turns towards right or towards left, it means that there is a problem with the horizontal movements. And what are the horizontal movements? Horizontal movements are abduction and adduction. If the patient has a tilting of the head towards the right or the left, it means that it is the cyclotorsions. That means some sort of your obliques which are associated with the cyclovertical movements, you know, those are basically affected. Example, the head tilt that you see in superior oblique palsy, it is very, very common. This example in this child, you can see that there's actually a head tilt towards the right side. Another thing that you, you should notice in your uh, Appearance is the presence of any sort of craniofacial abnormality, right? So usually the patients who have some sort of craniosynostosis or craniofacial abnormalities, they usually have anomalous position of the orbit and anomalous position of the globe. That will also, that will usually lead to strabismus, right? And here, uh, example that I would like to give you is that of the Cruzon syndrome. 
the one more thing that you should see in the appearance is the eyelid shape and position many a time the patients will have ptosis and you should know that ptosis is actually associated with lots of strabismus and sometimes ptosis might actually lead to pseudo strabismus also okay that's again a topic of discussion for another video then again you should look at the asymmetry or abnormality of the palpable fissures which is quite characteristic of certain oculomotor disorders right okay. so for example in this picture you can see the first picture in the, sorry, the center picture you can see that the patient seems to be looking straight forward however when you ask the patient to look towards the right side what do you observe you observe the palpable fissure height here okay this uh, this palpable fissure and this palpable fissure so compare this this seems to be much narrowed down right and this position is called adduction so whenever you are seeing narrowing of the palpable fissure in adduction that is quite a giveaway for your duan's retraction syndrome so this now another fourth feature that you are going to see in patients you know in up in patients appearance in order to detect you know squint is sometimes these prominent eyes that you see in graves orbitopathy because we all know that orbitopathy or graves orbitopathy is usually associated with the problems in the medial rectus and in the inferior rectus right now because of that usually these patients will have esotropia and hypotropia esotropia is inward deviation and hypotropia is downward deviation right so you should never miss such a uh, such important changes in the patient's appearance because they often give you the clue towards the etiology of the squint now let us come to the proper uh, topic of discussion that is the hirschberg's corneal reflex test okay so what is this hirschberg's corneal reflex test in hirschberg's corneal reflex test basically we use a spotlight or a torch light and the distance between the torch and the patient is going to be about 33 cm this torch is going to be shown uh, on the patient's glabella and now the corneal reflections of this torch uh, will be observed with both the eyes open now we will see that if the patient actually has these reflexes uh, falling right at the center of the pupil in both the eyes it means that the patient is actually orthotrophic now in this case the patient might also be uh, having some sort of phoria that you'll only know after you do your cover test but for the purpose of simplicity we will say that the patient is orthotropic on hirschberg's corneal reflex test that means there's no squint uh, there's no manifest squint present at this point now if there was some manifest or apparent squint present in the patient example in this first picture as you can see the eye seems to be slightly deviated towards the nose in the right eye so this is what is called as eso deviation here if you actually observe the corneal reflex if you see the corneal reflex is slightly towards the temporal part of the pupil and not in the center so what do we observe we observe that the reflex is slightly shifted temporally okay so in eso deviation the reflex is shifted temporally now what about exo deviation in exo deviation the eyeball is shifted temporally that is towards outside and what about the reflex the reflex is more on the inside that is nasally right so in exo deviation the reflex is shifted nasally now what about the vertical deviations in the first thing that you can see here is that the eyeball is rotated downwards or deviated downward now as the eyeball is deviated downward the reflex will be deviated towards the upper part of the pupil so in hypo deviation that is a deviation of the eye down eyeball downwards the reflex is shifted upwards in the pupil and totally opposite will happen in case of hyper deviation that is the deviation of the eyeball upwards in which the reflex is towards the downside of the pupil so i hope that is clear now the hirschberg's corneal reflex is basically based on the concept of angle kappa the angle kappa is basically an angle which is formed between the pupillary axis and the visual axis now what is your pupillary axis the pupillary axis is an axis which passes through the center of the pupil and to the nodal point and then into the center of the posterior pole or your fundus whereas the visual axis basically passes from the fixation point that is the point where you try what you are trying to look at right and the image is formed at the fovea so 
a, a line which is going to join your fixation point and the fovea is called the visual axis and the angle which is formed between the pupillary axis and the visual axis is called the angle kappa. Now, if you want to know more about angle kappa and regarding the angles and axis of the eye, we have a video on the channel named as angle kappa. Now, as I told you that this angle kappa basically determines your Hirschberg's corneal reflex test. And similarly, you can also de determine your angle kappa based on the reflex. Now, if it is centered right at the center of the uh, pupil, if your reflex is centered at the pupil, the angle kappa is set to be zero. So that's a very hypothetical condition where your pupillary axis and your visual axis are supposed to coincide. However, that does not happen because we know that the fovea is definitely present temporally and not at the center of the posterior pole, right? So that I will explain to you in a while. But for now, what I want you to focus here is that whenever the reflection is formed towards the nose, that means on the nasal side of the pupil, the angle kappa is said to be positive. And whenever the reflex is formed on the outside of the pupil, that means on the temporal aspect, the angle kappa now becomes negative. So this is a very important point to remember that the angle kappa is positive towards the nose. So that's a mnemonic that you can remember. Now, so what I what was I telling you is that the pupillary axis and the visual axis, if they were actually to coincide perfectly with each other, you will actually have no angle kappa right the angle kappa will virtually become zero and at that time a perfect uh, corneal reflection will form right at the center of both the pupils however is that possible no it's not possible because your fovea is present slightly temporal to the posterior pole it's not present right at the center of the posterior pole it's present temporally right so if this is the location of the fovea so definitely there will be a difference between pupillary axis and the visual axis and definitely there will be an angle kappa and if you can see over here that if this is your visual axis between the fixation point and the fovea you can see that the visual axis is coming out from the nasal aspect of your uh, cornea right so definitely where should be your uh, corneal reflex form the corneal reflex also will form slightly at the nasal aspect from the center of the pupil right and that angle will be your <clears throat> sorry and that angle will be your angle kappa right so physiologically or normally in every patient basically you will have a normal positive angle kappa of around three degrees okay in any orthotropic or emetropic eye so therefore when we say a person is normal actually speaking it does not mean that the reflexes are formed right at the center of the pupil it basically means that the reflexes are actually formed slightly nasal to the pupil and this could be about three degrees nasal to the pupil okay so what is normal normal is a positive angle kappa of about three degrees anything more than three degrees will be your pathology and anything less than three degrees will also be pathological okay so i hope this point is clear till now now so what is meant by a larger angle kappa or a larger positive angle kappa now here what if your fovea was to shift even more temporal uh, even more to a temporal position now before we had our fovea here and now suppose the fovea has shifted even more temporally that is say here. Now obviously your visual axis will also change. The visual axis will come out of the cornea more nasally. So as the visual axis is coming out more nasally, so where will the reflex form? The reflex will also shift more nasally. Now as the reflex is shifting more nasally, what did I tell you? As the reflex shift towards the nose, the angle kappa becomes more positive right so the angle kappa here has become more positive right so in this case and one more point that i want you to remember that i told you before is that in hirschberg's corneal reflex test whenever the reflex is nasal it means that the person has exodeviation right so if you were to see such a patient who has more positive angle kappa and you shine a torch on his glabella and you, and you actually try to focus on his reflexes, what will you notice? You will notice that the reflexes are formed more nasally. And obviously you will think that the patient has actually exotropia. However, this exotropia is because of a larger positive angle kappa and not because of the squint per se, right? So therefore, this is called pseudostrabismus or pseudoexotropia. And it is pseudo because it is because of the positive angle kappa.
right now this is usually seen in case of hypermetropes okay however there are multiple other conditions also in which uh, the macula can be dragged more temporarily and those are called ectopic macular conditions now these conditions could be retinopathy of prematurity toxocara canis retinitis congenital retinal folds as well now these conditions will cause ectopia of the macula and therefore can cause pseudo exotropia right so here what did we talk about we talked about an excessive or larger positive angle kappa leading to exotropia pseudo exotropia now what if we were actually uh, to move this fovea more inferiorly that means more towards the nasal point okay so this is a normal fovea which is present temporarily now what if in certain condition the fovea shifts to more towards the nasal side okay so what will happen to your visual axis now the visual axis will sh get shifted in such a way that the reflex which is formed now from the hirschberg's corneal reflex test will now be formed more temporally right and the angle kappa will now decrease okay in its degrees and sometimes even become negative as shown over here right so if your fovea was present here where would be your visual axis your visual axis will be somewhat here and we know that the normal visual axis was here before so this was the initial angle kappa say a and now because of the shifting of the fovea the next angle kappa will be here say b obviously b is less than a right so as the fovea shifts downward what is happening the angle kappa is decreasing right and sometimes if it crosses the center and reaches on the nasal side your angle kappa has now shifted above this center and reached the temporal part of the cornea and that is called a negative angle kappa right so now what will happen if you see a reflex on the temporal side you will feel that the eyes are shifted inwards that means the patient has esotropia right however you should know that this esotropia is not normal it is because of a negative angle kappa and this is a pseudo esotropia right so a negative angle kappa is usually very rare compared to a positive angle kappa and it is seen in case of myopes so i hope that is clear now this is what i was talking about pseudo exotropia now here in the first picture you can make out that the child actually seems to have an eye which is deviated outward right at the same time the pupil reflex also seems to be present more on the nasal side of the pupil compared to the center right so this will tell you that the patient actually has exotropia however if you put an occluder in front of this eye what is happening if this was normal exotropia if this was real exotropia this eye would actually take fixation and come in the center and the pupillary reflex also will come in the center but that does not happen in this condition this tells you that there's something wrong and maybe we are dealing with a you know very uh, maybe we are dealing with a very large positive angle kappa right so you go ahead and do a fundus examination and what do you find you find that the, the fovea which should have been somewhere here has actually been you know dragged more temporally in this condition right so this tells you that this is pseudo exotropia and you are dealing with a large positive angle kappa right this is seen in retinopathy of prematurity it, is, it can be seen in toxocara canis or it could be seen in congenital retinal folds so all these folds will basically you know pull your fovea more temporally now this brings us to a very important clinical nugget now sometimes when you see an eye which is deviating and the reflex is also deviated either to the nasal side or to the temporal side sometimes just by your hirschberg's corneal reflex test and just by covering the eye which has a normal central reflex you can get an idea of fixation you can get an idea whether the patient has a central fixation or the patient has an eccentric fixation if the patient has central fixation in the eye which is deviated and central fixation means that the image is formed at the fovea okay then if you cover the eye which does not have squint or the eye which does not have deviation the deviated eye is going to move and come to the center okay however if you cover the normal eye and still the deviated eye does not come to the center it means that the image is not formed at the fovea 
it means that the image is being formed somewhere eccentrically and the patient has eccentric fixation this is what we saw in this picture the eye was not moving towards the center even after occlusion of the left eye and therefore we said that the patient actually has a pseudo uh, pseudo exotropia and not the true exotropia right so this eccentric fixation is however more common in esotropes now sometimes what will happen is the corneal reflection will be you know so mildly displaced example in very small angle strabismus that means sometimes the amount of strabismus will be as less as 10 prism diopters and even lesser than that so in those conditions you know with your naked eyes you'll not be able to pick up that there's any difference in the corneal reflexes and such sort of you know ex uh, such sort of deviations are called microtropias why is it called micro it is called micro because the angle of strabismus is very less less than 10 prism diopters now at this point we have learned how to detect the presence of squint right now the question is can we actually you know get an estimate of the squint using your Hirschberg's corneal reflex test the answer is yes we can for every one millimeter displacement of the light reflects from the center it is equal to about seven degrees of squint on a globe and that will uh, be equal to 15 prism diopters so here what you should know is one degree is actually equal to two prism diopters roughly right so your seven degrees will come to about 15 prism diopter this two is approximate uh, value right now another uh, approximate way to assess the squint uh, uh, estimate the amount of squint which is present is uh, was given basically by von Uden. so von Uden said that whenever it is present in the center it is called normal right and to be more specific it's not exactly in the center it's slightly nasal three degrees nasal right now if the reflex is present at the margin of your pupil okay the amount of deviation is about 15 degrees right now it could be et or it could be xt that means it could be esotropia or it could be exotropia based on whether your reflex is present on the temporal edge of the pupil or on the nasal edge of the pupil if it is present on the temporal edge it means that the eye is deviated inwards as in this condition and therefore we have written et that is esotropia right now moving ahead so if the reflex is now present say not on the edge but in between the edge of the pupil and in between the limbus then the amount of deviation is almost 30 degrees right now if it is present at the limbus it is 45 degrees and if it is present beyond the beyond the limbus then the amount of deviation is more than 45 degrees so remember these three magical numbers given by von Uden, where 15 degrees is at the edge of the pupil 30 degrees is between the edge and the limbus 45 is at the limbus and beyond the limbus is more than 45 degrees so that was about the Hirschberg's corneal reflex in particular i hope you found it useful that's all for today thank you and have a nice day